Welcome to a new series titled Masterboard Theater, where I will share stories of great intrigue or interest on a varied number of topics while making a masterboard. Some masterboards may relate or be directly inspired by the subject of the story or by their artistic style, color palette, perceived personality, reputation, artistic repertoire, or other aspects. That is, whenever it's possible. However, it is not guaranteed that the masterboard I create during the storytelling segment will relate in any way at all to the story. It could be merely a masterboard I felt drawn to create. In any event, please join me as I create for you while telling you a story I feel worth telling and knowing. This is Masterboard Theater, and I'm your host, Miss Darling. Amadeo Modigliani was born into a Jewish family in Laverno, Italy in 1884. A port city Livorno had long served as a refuge for those persecuted for their religion and was home to a large Jewish community as a result. His maternal great-great-grandfather, Solomon Garson, had immigrated to Livorno in the 18th century as a refugee. Amadeo's mother was descended from an intellectual scholarly family that for generations had lived along the Mediterranean coastline. Fluent in many languages, her ancestors were authorities on sacred Jewish texts and had founded a school of Talmudic studies. Family legend traced the family lineage to the 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza. The family business was a credit agency with branches in Luverno, Marseille, Tunis, and London. Modigliani's father, Flaminio, was a member of an Italian Jewish family of successful businessmen and entrepreneurs. While not as culturally sophisticated as the Garsons, they knew how to invest and develop thriving business endeavors. When the Garson and Bodigliani families announced the engagement of their children, Flaminio was a wealthy young mining engineer. He managed the mine in Sardinia and also managed the almost 30,000 acres of timberland which the family also owned. However, a reversal in fortune occurred in 1883. An economic downturn in the price of metal plunged the Modiglianis into bankruptcy. Modigliani's mother then used her social contacts to establish a school, and along with her two sisters, made the school into a successful enterprise. Amadio Modigliani was the fourth child whose birth coincided with the disastrous financial collapse of his father's business interests. But it was a fortunate turn of events because Amadeo's birth saved the family from ruin. According to an ancient law, creditors could not seize the bed of a pregnant woman or a mother with a newborn child. The bailiffs entered the family's home just as Eugenie went into labor. The family protected their most valuable assets by piling them on top of her. Modigliani grew up in a close relationship with his mother, who taught him at home until he was ten. But plagued with health problems after an attack of pleurisy when he was about eleven, a few years later, he developed a case of typhoid fever. When he was 16, he was once again taken ill and contracted tuberculosis. After Modigliani recovered from the second bout of pleurisy, 
his mother took him on a tour of southern Italy, Naples, Capri, Rome, and Amalfi, and then north to Florence and Venice. His mother was, in many ways, instrumental in his ability to pursue art as a vocation. When he was 11 years of age, she had noted in her diary, The child's character is still so unformed that I cannot say what I think of it. He behaves like a spoiled child, but he does not lack intelligence. We shall have to wait and see what is inside this chrysalis. Perhaps an artist? But in fact, Modigliani is known to have drawn and painted from a very early age and thought himself already a painter, his mother wrote, even before beginning formal studies. Despite her misgivings that launching him on a course of studying art would impinge upon his other duties, his mother indulged the young Modigliani's passion for the creative. At the age of 14, while sick with typhoid fever, he raved in his delirium that he wanted, above all else, to see the paintings in the Palazzo Picci and the Uffizi in Florence. As his town's local museum housed only a sparse few paintings by the Italian Renaissance masters, the tales he had heard about the great works held in Florence intrigued him, and it was a source of considerable despair to him in his sickened state that he might never get a chance to view them in person. His mother promised that she would take him to Florence herself the moment he was recovered. Not only did she fulfill this promise, but she also undertook to enroll him with the best painting master in town. Modigli showed great promise while with Michelli and ceased his studies only when he was forced to by the onset of tuberculosis. Modigliani's connection with the iconoclasts of the Macchialioli movement, meaning a dash of color, was through his first art teacher. Michelli was not only a member himself, but had been a pupil of the founder of the movement. Michelli's work, however, was so fashionable and the genre so commonplace that the young Modigliani reacted against it, preferring to ignore landscapes characterized by the movement. His teacher tried to encourage his pupils to paint en plein air but Modigliani never really got a taste for this style of working, sketching in cafes, but preferring to paint indoors, especially in his own studio. Even when compelled to paint landscapes, three are known to exist, Modigliani chose an unusual palette. While with Michelli, Modigliani studied not only landscape, but also portraiture, still life, and the nude. His fellow students recall that the last was where he displayed his greatest talent, and apparently this was not an entirely academic pursuit for the teenager. When not painting nudes, he was occupied with seducing the household maid. Modigliani nonetheless found favor with his teacher, who referred to him as Superman a pet name reflecting the fact that Modigliani was not only quite adept at his art, but also that he regularly quoted from Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Fattori himself would often visit the studio and approved of the young artist's innovations. In 1902, Modigliani continued what was to be a lifelong infatuation with life drawing, enrolling in the free school of nude studies of the Accademia di Belle Arti in Florence. A year later, while still suffering from tuberculosis, he moved to Venice, where he registered to study at another academy. It is in Venice that he first smoked hashish, and rather than studying, 
began to spend time frequenting disreputable parts of the city. The impact of these lifestyle choices upon his developing artistic style is open to conjecture, although these choices do seem to be more than simple teenage rebellion or the cliched hedonism and bohemianism that was almost expected of artists of the time. His pursuit of the seedier side of life appears to have roots in his appreciation of radical philosophies, including those of Nietzsche. Consequently, he developed the belief that the only route to true creativity was through defiance and disorder. Oscar Giglia, with whom he corresponded, was seven years Modigliani's senior, and it is likely that it was he who showed the young man the limits of his horizons in Laverno. Like all precocious teenagers, Modigliani preferred the company of older companions, and Giglia's role in his adolescence was to be a sympathetic ear as he worked himself out, principally in the convoluted letters that he regularly sent and which survive today. Dear friend, I write to pour myself out to you and to affirm myself to myself. I am the prey of great powers that surge forth and then disintegrate. A bourgeois told me today, insulted me, that I, or at least my brain, was lazy. It did me good. I should like such a warning every morning upon awakening. But they cannot understand us, nor can they understand life. In 1906, Modigliani moved to Paris, then the focal point of the avant-garde. He became a squatter in a commune for penniless artists in Montmartre, renting himself a studio nearby. Modigliani himself presented, initially at least, as one would expect the son of a family trying to maintain the appearances of its lost financial standing. His wardrobe was dapper without ostentation, and the studio he rented was appointed in a style appropriate to someone with a finely attuned taste in plush drapery and Renaissance reproductions. He soon made efforts to assume the guise of the bohemian artist, but even in his brown corduroys, scarlet scarf, and large black hat, he continued to appear as if he were slumming it, having fallen upon harder times. When he first arrived in Paris, he wrote home regularly to his mother. He sketched his nudes at the Academie Colossari, and he drank wine in moderation. He was at that time considered by those who knew him as a bit reserved, verging on the asocial. He is noted to have commented upon meeting Picasso, who at the time was wearing his trademark workman's clothes, that even though the man was a genius, that did not excuse his uncouth appearance. Within a year of arriving in Paris, however, Modigliani's demeanor and reputation had changed dramatically. He transformed himself from a dapper artist into a sort of prince of vagabonds. Over time, his well-appointed apartment became a place in upheaval. The Renaissance reproductions discarded from the walls and the plush drapes in disarray. Modigliani was already an alcoholic and a drug addict by this time and his studio reflected this. His behavior at this time shed some light upon his developing style as an artist in that the studio had become almost a sacrificial effigy for all that he resented about the academic art that had marked his life and his training up to that point. Not only did he remove all the trappings of his bourgeois heritage from his studio, but he also set about destroying practically all of his own early work, which he described as childish baubles done when I was a dirty bourgeois. 
The motivation for this violent rejection of his earlier self is the subject of considerable speculation. From the time of his arrival in Paris, Modigliani consciously crafted a charade persona for himself and cultivated his reputation as a hopeless drunk and voracious drug user. His escalating intake of drugs and alcohol may have been a means by which he masked his tuberculosis from friends, few of whom knew of his condition. Tuberculosis, the leading cause of death in France by 1900, was highly communicable. There was no cure, and those who had it were feared, ostracized, and pitied. Modigliani thrived on camaraderie and would not let himself be isolated as an invalid. He used drink and drugs to ease his physical pain, help him to maintain a facade of vitality, and allow him to continue to create his art. Modigliani's use of drink and drugs intensified from about 1914 onward. After years of remission and recurrence, this was the period during which the symptoms of his tuberculosis worsened, signaling that the disease had reached an advanced stage. He sought the company of artists such as Utrillo and Soutin, seeking acceptance and validation for his work from his colleagues. Modigliani's behavior stood out even in these bohemian surroundings. He carried on frequent affairs, drank heavily, and used absinthe and hashish. While drunk, he would sometimes strip himself naked at social gatherings, and so it would come as no surprise that he died in Paris, aged 35. He became the epitome of the tragic artist creating a posthumous legend almost as well known as that of Vincent van Gogh. During his early years in Paris, Modigliani worked at a furious pace. He was constantly sketching, making as many as a hundred drawings a day. However, many of his works were lost, destroyed by him as inferior, left behind in his frequent changes of address, or given to girlfriends who did not keep them. He was first influenced by Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, but around 1907 he became fascinated with the work of Paul Cézanne. Eventually he developed his own unique style, one that cannot be adequately categorized with those of other artists. Influenced by African art, he began to elongate his portraits eventually developing a strong, recognizable style in his work. He met the first serious love of his life, Russian poet Anna Ashkmatova, in 1910, when he was 26. They had studios in the same building, and although 21-year-old Anna had recently married, they began an affair. Anna was tall with dark hair, pale skin, and gray-green eyes. She embodied Modigliani's aesthetic ideal, and the pair became engrossed in each other. After a year, however, Anna returned to her husband. In 1909, Modigliani returned home to Liverno, sickly and tired from his wild lifestyle. But soon he was back in Paris, this time renting another studio. He originally saw himself as a sculptor rather than a painter and was encouraged to continue after an ambitious young art dealer took an interest in him. Although a series of Modigliani sculptures were exhibited in 1912, within two years he abandoned sculpting and focused solely on his painting a move precipitated by the difficulty in acquiring sculptural materials due to the outbreak of war and by Modigliani's physical debilitation. 
Modigli painted a series of portraits of contemporary artists and friends, all set for stylized renditions. At the outset of World War I, he tried to enlist in the army but was refused because of his poor health. He was a handsome man and attracted much female attention. Women came and went until Beatrice Hastings entered his life. She stayed with him for almost two years, was the subject of several of his portraits, including Madame Pompadour and the object of much of his drunken wrath. When the British painter Nina Hammett arrived in 1914 on her first evening there, the smiling man at the next table in the cafe introduced himself as Modigliani, painter and Jew. They became great friends. The several dozen nudes Modigliani painted between 1916 and 1919 constitute many of his best known works. This series of nudes was commissioned by Modigliani's dealer and friend, Leopold Zorowski, who lent the artist use of his apartment, supplied models and painting materials, and 15 and 20 francs each day for his work. The paintings from this arrangement were thus different from his previous depictions of friends and lovers, or with an eye to their commercial potential rather than originating from the artist's personal circle of acquaintances. The Paris show of 1917 was Bodigliani's only solo exhibition during his life and is notorious in modern art history for its sensational public reception and the attendant issues of obscenity. The show was closed by police on its opening day but continued thereafter, most likely after the removal of paintings from the gallery street front window. On a trip to Nice, which had been conceived and organized by Zobrowski, Modigliani and other artists tried to sell their works to rich tourists. He managed to sell a few pictures, but only for a few francs each. Despite this, during this time, he produced most of the paintings that later became his most popular and valued works. In the spring of 1917, from a conservative bourgeois background, Hebertine was renounced by her devout Roman Catholic family for her liaison with Modigliani, whom they saw as little more than a debauched derelict. Despite her family's objections, Soon they were living together. Modigliani ended his relationship with the English poet and art critic Beatrice Hastings, and a short time later, they moved into a studio. Jean began to pose for him and appears in several of his paintings, eventually becoming a principal subject for Modigliani's art. Towards the end of the First World War, early in 1918, Modigliani left Paris with Hibertine to escape from the war and travel to Nice. They would spend a year in France. During that time, they had a busy social life with many friends, including Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Pablo Picasso, Giorgio de Chirico, and André Durain. After he and Hebutine moved to Nice on 29 November 1918, she gave birth to a daughter whom they named Jean. Modigliani already had a son from his relationship with Simone Thiroux and at least two other illegitimate children. In May 1919, they returned to Paris with their infant daughter and moved into an apartment. Hebertine became pregnant again. Modigliani then got engaged to her, but Jean's parents were against the marriage, especially because of Modigliani's reputation as an alcoholic and drug user. However, Modigliani officially recognized her daughter as his child. The wedding plans were shattered independently of Jean's parents' resistance when Modigliani discovered 
he had a severe form of tuberculosis. Although he continued to paint, Modigliani's health deteriorated rapidly and his alcohol-induced blackouts became more frequent. In 1920, after not hearing from him for several days, a neighbor checked on the family and found Modigliani in bed, delirious, and holding on to Hebertine. A doctor was summoned, but little could be done because Modigliani was in the final stage of his disease, tuberculous meningitis. He died on 24 January 1920 at the Hospital de la Charité. There was an enormous funeral attended by many from the artistic communities where they had lived. When Modigliani died, 21-year-old Hebertine was eight months pregnant with their second child. A day later, she was taken to her parents' home. There, inconsolable, she threw herself out of a fifth-floor window two days after Modigliani's death, killing herself and her unborn child. The two were buried in different cemeteries, and it was not until 1930 that her embittered family allowed her body to be moved to rest beside Modigliani. A single tombstone honors them both. His epitaph reads, struck down by death at the moment of glory. Hers reads, devoted companion to the extreme sacrifice. During the 1920s, in the wake of Modigliani's career and spurred on by comments by other artists crediting drugs with the genius of his style, many hopefuls tried to emulate his success by embarking on a path of substance abuse and bohemian excess. Salmon claimed that whereas Modigliani was a totally pedestrian artist when sober, from the day that he abandoned himself to certain forms of debauchery, an unexpected light came upon him, transforming his art. From that day on, he became one who must be counted among the masters of living art. Some art historians suggest that it is entirely possible that Modigliani would have achieved even greater artistic heights had he not been obsessed by and destroyed by his own self-indulgences. During his lifetime, he sold a number of his works, but never for any great amount of money. What funds he did receive soon vanished for his habits. Managing only one solo exhibition in his life and giving his work away in exchange for meals in restaurants Modigliani died destitute. In, in June 2010, Modigliani's limestone carving of a woman's head became the third most expensive sculpture ever sold. Nude sitting on a divan is one of a series of nudes painted by Modigliani in 1917 that created the sensation when exhibited in Paris that year. According to the catalog description from the 2010 sale of the painting at Sotheby's, seven nudes were exhibited in the 1917 show. This nude painting realized $170,405,000 at a Christie's New York sale on November 9, 2015, a record for a Modigliani painting and placing it high among the most expensive paintings ever sold. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Masterboard Theater. If you enjoyed this presentation, be sure to like the video and leave a comment with your thoughts and impressions. I would be most grateful. Until next time, I'm Miss Darling, and this has been Masterboard Theater.
Thank you.